hour away. They oh, spent like no. months doing this oh. ice rink. They put an ice rink in the co- middle of Coachella. Wow. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. And then he was like, I don't want to do it. And then they had to like improv like a... Good afternoon, everyone. We'll take our seats and get started. If you're missing a seat, put up your hand and Carolyn will help you find one. So good afternoon. It's wonderful to have you all here as well as communities across Canada online. Thank you so much for being an important part of this conversation. I know lots of good conversation has already been happening here and there's a lot more to come in the hour and a half ahead. So I'd like to begin by recognizing that we're gathering here today in Ottawa part of the traditional territory unceded of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Canada 2020 is especially grateful to be part of this land's continued history of sharing and exchange. I'm Braden Cayley, Executive Director of Canada 2020, and for 17 years now, this organization has been committed to building a progressive future for Canada and helping shape a more progressive world. Through events, research, podcasts, and more, we've built a network of progressive ideas and people that shape policy conversations, and most importantly, the action that comes from those. Our sustaining partners and dedicated audience members like you make all of this work possible. And for today, I want to extend a very special thank you to our supporting partners for today's event. Uh, And we are very, you may have seen them on the screen, but the Maple Leaf Center for Food Security, please give them a warm round of applause. And the Arel Family Foundation. So I'm excited for today's conversation in particular. Food is essential to health and well-being, and yet 5.8 million Canadians are experiencing food insecurity, meaning they struggle to access the food they need due to financial constraints or other considerations or challenges. This has serious implications for individuals and for our healthcare systems. The concept that food is medicine is emerging as an innovative framework to which policy could treat food more often as healthcare. I'm looking forward to hearing more about this framework today and how it's working in other jurisdictions and parts of the United States, which by the way, has a national food as medicine summit also taking place today and what potential that idea and others like it have in store for Canada too. So in that spirit, I'd like to bring up a very special guest for some opening comments, a friend who works tirelessly not only to represent the people of Milton as a member of parliament, but as a key leader in the federal government's work to strengthen our public health care system. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to the stage, the parliamentary secretary to Canada's Minister of Health, Adam Vancouver. Thanks, Adam. Thanks very much, Brayden. Uh, it's nice to be here with everybody today. Thanks for uh, for the invitation. My name is Adam Vancouverden. I'm the Member of Parliament for Milton. I'm also the Parliamentary Secretary to the Ministers of Health and Sport. And it's a sincere pleasure to uh, to be here, but also to listen. Uh, and it's also nice to see my colleague, Sean Casey, who's the chair of the Health Committee that I get to work on. Uh, and I don't know if I see any other MPs or senators here, but uh, I'm sure lots will come in because this is a topic of uh, of, of hot conversation, uh, it's very pertinent uh, in the in the wake of COVID nineteen to be talking about our health in various contexts. So, uh, it's also something that I care deeply about. Um, not only do I love food, I love talking about how more people can access good, healthy food, recognizing that there are a lot of uh, barriers between people and accessing their healthiest lives. Uh, I'm lucky to be from Halton. Uh, we're a very privileged community, but there is food insecurity in our community as well. And I want to acknowledge the good work of the Maple Leaf Center for Food uh, Security, as well as the Errol family for uh, contributing to today's event and, and making it possible, uh, but also an organization called Food for Life. They're a food rescue agency and they do extraordinary work and they talk about this concept quite a lot too. So uh, I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with uh, with Food for Life and uh, they just, they sponsored our community cleanup on the weekend and there was lots of fresh rescued veggies from local grocery stores for uh, for everybody to enjoy as we put on gloves and, and grabbed bags to, uh, to go pick up trash around Milton. Um, but I want to thank everybody here for all your work as I look across the room. I see a lot of people who I follow on social media. So thanks for your extraordinary expertise and all your research and your advocacy for the important areas that you work on. Over the past three years, we've seen our health system face some really extraordinary challenges. But these challenges also come with opportunities for us to come together in rooms like this and talk about innovative solutions. Solutions that can help address problems that we're facing now and problems that we may face in the future. And across the country, two in five adults have chronic diseases such as heart disease, or type 2 diabetes, and we know that dietary choices that we make have a massive impact on either raising or lowering the risk for those diseases. And we also know that some of those choices are not necessarily personal ones that people are free to make themselves. They're influenced by external factors. 
Sometimes making the healthy choice isn't always easy or intuitive. There are significant work under underway for, through various levels of, of government, but also organizations like many of yours to support, encourage, and educate Canadians to make healthier choices and to make it possible for them to do so. Health Canada is actively delivering on a multi-year healthy eating strategy, which consists of a suite of initiatives to improve the food environment and help make the Chelsea choice the easier choice for Canadians. Just recently, we finished some work on um, on a bill in the health committee about marketing to kids, and uh, it uh, it was honestly a hard push. It was it was challenging. You know, there was a lot of resistance, but I think we've landed at a really good place. And I want to thank and acknowledge my colleague MP Patricia Latanzio for taking on that work because uh, when you have an opportunity to do a private member's bill, there's a lot of a lot of choices to make. And uh, um, Patricia made a good one, and we, we managed to uh, to get some important legislation done with her. One of these, uh, another initiative is front of pack nutritional labeling. Nearly half of all packaged foods sold in Canada uh, in grocery stores are high in natural, uh, in saturated fat, sugars, and or sodium. And the new magnifying glass that will appear on labels will highlight important information for Canadians to consider as they're buying groceries. And we want all Canadians to have access to the information that they need in order to make informed choices. And in the coming years, we hope this will be one more tool that can be used to promote healthy choices. Uh, I believe in more information always being a good thing. And, uh, and this will be in addition to other tools like the new Canada Food Guide. Earlier this week, Health Canada announced a new public policy update that proposes an approach to restricting the advertising of food and beverages to children, which is a long time coming. I know a lot of people here were, were very busy advocating for it, and I thank you for that work. I also note that the billboards around Ottawa have since come down. There was uh, some, some good uh, pressure put on elected officials uh, to take those choices. And uh, if you didn't see it, it was a, it was a plate uh, that was divided up similar to the way that we would like to see our dinner plates uh, set up, except instead of half of the plate being uh, fruit and vegetables, vegetables, I should say, um, it was half of the plate was candy, and then another half of the plate was pretzels, and then there was potato chips and soda. And, uh, and those are the choices that, uh, that are in front of so many kids when, when they're looking for a snack. It's never too late to change eating habits, but we know that children are particularly vulnerable to food and beverage advertising that undermines healthy eating, uh, influences their attitudes, their preferences, their purchase requests, their consumption patterns, and ultimately their overall health. And so our, our plan will, will start advertising on, on television and digital media where kids spend a significant amount of time and they're exposed to a lot of food advertising and this bill will create new regulations to protect them from some of those har harmful advertisements. Most of the ads are, are for food that contribute to unhealthy diets with in excessive intakes of sugar and fats and salt, which are a key modifiable risk factor for obesity and chronic diseases. And this also ends up having a massive downstream impact on our health system as they interact with it more frequently throughout their lives. Food truly has the power to be medicine that helps fuel us to do the things that we love most, whether that's walking to work, biking, cross-country skiing or kayaking, or running after our kids, taking our dogs for a walk, the list goes on. But I look forward to the discussion that will happen here today and how it can and will feed into future efforts to make Canada the healthiest country in the world. So thank you so much for having me here today. I'm sorry that I can only stay until one, but I'm looking forward to insightful conversations and look forward to some follow-up too. Chelsea's here. If uh, you can't find me, uh, that's, uh, that's Chelsea over there, and she supports all of my work with the Minister of Health. Uh, so if you'd like to set up a meeting or something like that, then I would love to join you. And uh, and thanks to, to my friends at Maple Leaf Food Center for food uh, security. Sarah, it's good to see you again. We used to work at Right to Play together back in the day, uh, but we're finding our feet in, uh, in the world of health now. So thanks, everybody, and have a really great day. Thank you so much, Adam, both for being here, for sharing those insights, and also for a look at many of the ways that uh, the federal government is already looking at food and health issues together right now. We have a really exciting panel, including uh, a really great moderator, I think, that uh, I, the person I'll call up will introduce in a moment. As I mentioned before, though, today's event would not be happening without the guidance and support of the Maple Leaf Center for Food Security. Uh, and to frame up the specifics of where we're going to go with this conversation today and to introduce our extraordinary panel, please welcome their executive director, Sarah Stern. Thank you, Braden, and thank you to all of you for joining us here today. The Maple Leaf Center for Food Security is a registered charity that was launched around six years ago 
with a goal of reducing food insecurity by 50% in Canada by 2030. We want to do that collaboratively, working across sectors, and we know it will take all of us to make that happen. I first really heard about food insecurity as the center launched and was shocked to hear that at the time, 4 million people were experiencing food insecurity. Six years later, we're waiting for new data. It's going to come out imminently. But a year ago, that number had jumped to 6 million, and we can only expect the new data will show higher numbers. That means that today, one in six households and one in five children lives in a food insecure household. How can it be that in a nation as wealthy, as grounded in good values, where the importance of a social safety net is unquestioned, that six million Canadians live with food insecurity? How is it possible that that is not on the front page of every paper? It is a national crisis. For decades now, we've unjustly relied on the conscious, talent, and limited resources of the not-for-profit sector to solve this issue. They cannot solve it alone, and we must do better. People in Canada should not need to rely on charity to access food. A lot has happened in the past six years. There's been crisis after crisis around the world, none more pervasive than the COVID-19 pandemic that's been alluded to. Over and over, we heard that COVID-19 was an unprecedented crisis. Never before had the world faced such threat to our modern way of life, economy, and the health and safety of billions of people. While we've moved beyond the time of pandemic restrictions, the reality is we're still living in unprecedented times. The inflationary pressures at play over the past year have dramatically affected the ability of individuals and households to afford their basic necessities, especially food. Unemployment is low, and we're facing low labor shortages across sectors, but at the same time, hearing that food insecurity is going up and that people are struggling every day. Before the start of the pandemic, the Daily Bread Food Bank in Toronto supported around 60,000 people a month. I was there last week. Today, they're supporting 270,000 people a month. That's more than a fourfold increase. And we know they're not alone. We know that here in Ottawa, the numbers are skyrocketing as well. It is across the country. We know that only about a quarter of people who are food insecure go to food banks. But food bank visits can be considered the canary in the coal mine to suggest that the numbers of people experiencing food insecurity are on the rise. Food insecurity is a pervasive and significant problem. It is not a food scarcity issue. We produce more than enough food for everybody in Canada. Food insecurity is primarily driven by low income. It is a marker of material deprivation. It does not impact everyone equally. It disproportionately impacts households with children, single parents, and those with low educational attainment. One of the biggest disparities can be seen among different racial groups, in particular Black and Indigenous communities, which experience food insecurity rates far higher than the national average. About a year ago, we had a custom report done by Statistics Canada, and it demonstrated that close to 50% of people living in food insecure households over the age of 15 have a disability. 50%. The numbers are daunting, and the impacts are devastating. Food insecurity has been linked to a raft of health problems, including health disease, chronic pain, infectious disease, depression, and anxiety disorders. Pretty much every bad health condition you can think of is linked with not having the money to buy the food that you need. People who are food insecure are more likely to be facing multiple chronic conditions at once. Those experiencing the most severe levels of food insecurity, including going out without food for days, face the most negative health outcomes. Children who live in food insecure households have increased risk of developing poor mental health. The dietitians of Canada have deemed food insecurity a social determinant of health and a serious public health issue. The result is that people experiencing food insecurity land in the healthcare system. Nearly 50% of adults living in severely food insecure households are unable to for afford their prescription medication costs and end up skipping, delaying, or reducing their medications. Those who are unable to adhere to their medication make greater use of primary care services and are more likely to be admitted to acute care. 
Severely food insecure adults incur twice the health care costs of food secure adults. This averages more than $2,300 per year per person. This would mean that as of 2021, the 1.3 million people who were, who were experiencing severe food insecurity could have been costing our health care system over $3 billion per year. We know that targets and commitments can drive action. And in Canada in 2018, the federal government set a target to reduce poverty by 50%. And they've made great strides towards reaching that goal. Programs like the Canada Child Benefit has helped lift many families above the poverty line. The proposed Canada Disability Benefit could do the same thing for people living with disabilities. This target has driven action. Setting a target to reduce food insecurity in Canada will also drive action and investment. It will require a whole of government's approach and a lot of cross-sector collaboration. We've been working with partners across sectors to explore ways to address and reduce food insecurity. Over the past decade or so, programs began to emerge to help low-income households increase their intake of fruits and vegetables with the goal of addressing diet-related diseases. Many of these programs provide an incentive or credit that will help make purchasing easier. In the U.S., extra credits have been rolled into the Supplementary Nutrition Assistance Program, and it's been called Double Up SNAP. The results have been promising, but of course there's many questions. Over the past year, there's been an increased momentum in the U.S. Last fall, the White House held a conference on hunger, nutrition, and health that helped launch $8 billion in investments from public and private sector on commitments to help reduce hunger. In March of this year, the Biden-Harris administration announced the White House challenge to end hunger and build healthy communities, calling on organizations and individuals across sectors to make bold commitments to end food insecurity and diet-related diseases. We at the Maple Leaf Center for Food Security and our co-sponsor of today's event, the Errol Family Foundation, have invested in a few of these programs in Canada. We know that the biggest barrier to becoming food secure is economic. People need money to buy food. We know that putting more money in people's pockets will likely require structural and policy changes. And we know that there's no single program or a silver bullet that will solve food insecurity for everyone. But are there conditions under which food as medicine interventions could support people experiencing food insecurity? Today's panel will dive deeper into that connection between food insecurity and health, and will almost certainly include some debate on the programs. I'm really pleased to invite today's moderator, principal of the Gandalf Group, host of the Hurley Burley and Curse of Politics podcast, David Hurley, to our stage, as well as our panelists, Dr. Andrew Bazzari, the founding executive director of UHN's Gattuso Center for Social Medicine, Dr. Kate Mulligan, Senior Director of the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing, Catherine Scarf, Chief Program Officer and Co-Founder of Community Food Centers Canada, and Joshua Smee, Chief Executive Officer of Food First Newfoundland. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Welcome, distinguished panelists. Uh, everybody for being here. My name is uh, David Hurley and I'm moderating this and I, I need to emphasize that right off the top because I know nothing about this subject. Uh, I have no value to bring here so I'm going to leave that to, uh, to, these, to these people. I, you know, because of my work with the Maple Leaf Centre, I've become fairly conversant with the issue of food insecurity in Canada. But this idea of social prescribing or food as medicine is relatively new to me. So I'm interested in learning learning about it too. What I thought we would do to start off is, is we have a rich panel here that has a lot of different types of experiences. And I thought we'd just ask each of them to deliver a couple of minutes of opening remarks about what is it about this that interests them and what aspect of it are they working on? Andrew, can we start with you? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. I don't know if the, is my mic working? Sounds like it is great. You know, I've never had this kind of sort of pop uh, <laughs> microphone, so I apologize if it's placed or not but um you know i appreciate this on the invite on this and i know it's not working right so it is that was thumbs up okay mr miss saw you so i think uh one i i mean it was such a great uh opening from sarah i think about setting the stage on this issue i mean i think when we look at 
the connection between food insecurity and health, the literature is very clear. And I think we've seen this now for decades, and it's not surprising, I think, for anyone in the room. Uh, from a clinical perspective, though, it's something that we continue to see play out in this cycle. And it's really, I think, about the pathologies of poverty. We've talked about this as sort of food insecurity as a social or structural determinant of health. And I think the uh, framework from Sarah is very helpful about all of these barriers that are preventing people from accessing nutritious food. And again, the common denominator being poverty, but many other barriers that we've seen. Uh, and again, through the pandemic, I think this came uh, into sharp relief of the kind of uh, structural elements. And we saw this with the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. And we saw this play out with respect to the disproportionate impact on health outcomes. And so I think the, the real realities around food insecurity are people are two to three times more likely to have the chronic disease conditions. They can cost two to three times uh, more to the system. But I think ultimately we're failing on, and I think that is very expensive from both a clinical or health economic perspective. And so I think the one piece that we had a chance to do in the COVID pandemic program with uh, the Aero Foundation and Nourish and uh, to, and Food Share Toronto to actually deliver and prescribe good food boxes to people's households. And we covered over 200 families through the course of the pandemic. The results are not surprising. The challenge, they were huge benefits for mental health, for chronic disease, for perceived sense of health and well being. Uh, and again, unfortunately, this was really about the nonprofit sector and philanthropic sector picking up, working with the healthcare sector. And I think when I think about food as medicine, it really is about where our social systems are failing and healthcare systems having to step in or philanthropy and nonprofit sectors having to step in to try to fill some of these gaps. Uh, and I think, again, there's no silver bullet, but I think we're encouraged to see these kind of partnerships to address an issue that we know has only gotten worse. We are hearing CEOs of food banks now pleading every day on the radio to address this issue. And we're seeing this with our own healthcare workers where there's a lot of moral distress where we know the same people who cannot afford housing, who again, we are also one of the only countries that pharmacare cannot afford their medication or their groceries are the same folks coming back into our emergency department or primary care. And I think I would be remiss. It's not every day that your former vice dean is in the audience. And I think as a medical student, uh, you're not, I would have never thought about prescribing food to this discussion, but I think the realities are what would you have us do as health workers when you're seeing the same people come in and these same social systems failing the same communities and patients. Uh, so I appreciate that. That was like amazingly articulate. <laughs> you obviously did not have as many whiskey as I did last night. I could not replicate that. Um, I don't know if anybody here golfs or not, but I mean, Kate is impressive in her own right, but perhaps even more impressive is what I just learned. <laughs> which is that she's related, her last name is Mulligan, and she's related to the guy who invented the mulligan. <laughs> right? A free chance to do something over again, which is a concept that I rely on over and over and over again <laughs> in my life. Um, anyway, Kate, you're really on the ground yeah. in making this stuff happen, and it's much further along in terms of implementation in certain communities than I would have thought. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So sure. First of all, yes. If I, you know, if at first I don't succeed, I try, try again. <laughs> uh, so, secondly, yes. So um, I am the director of the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing, which is funded by the Public Health Canada, uh, Public Health Agency of Canada in large part. Um, and we try, we're trying to bring together different folks doing social prescribing work all across the country um, to build intersectoral collaborations, to celebrate good work and to learn. Um, and social prescribing really means supported referrals between healthcare and community services for a range of things, basic needs like income and housing, well-being, mental health and so on. And yes, food. So, um, yes, I think there is a lot of potential around food prescribing. We've seen some really interesting initiatives right across the country, and you'll hear about a lot of them today, um, where we can almost take literally the food as medicine credo. Um, what would our health system look like if we had pharmacare? with an F, right? And we really thought, if food is medicine, what if we funded it the way um, we could fund and support pharmaceutical drugs. 
um, right? It would be less expensive. We know what the health benefits are. Um, and, and people are often concerned about stigma, but there's, there's no stigma for receiving cardiac medication um, or other uh, government supported interventions. And, you know, if we reframe access to food uh, as part of healthcare, we can start rethinking um, in more universal ways under sort of targeted universalist approaches. So goals common for everyone, strategies targeted for the people who need them most. Um, we could really make a big impact. Uh, and we can do that best at the community scale, uh, from my perspective. So right now in the vast majority of provinces across Canada, we overinvest in acute care. Right? So the vast majority of healthcare spending goes toward hospitals, physician services, and pharmaceutical drugs. Very, very little goes to community-based approaches. Uh, but we saw during the pandemic, for example, that community place-based initiatives in neighborhoods with communities facing barriers to health equity are the only ones that can make a difference for some people um, who, are, who have significant reasons to mistrust big institutions and structures and systems that have systematically marginalized and excluded them in a deliberate way um, over the long period of colonization. These organizations, these places worked with community health workers, paid and voluntary, um, to build trusted relationships to be able to access things like good food boxes, uh, drop-offs of groceries, and so on. And they can do it in a way that is tailored and specific to each community. And that's really at the heart of social prescribing, that it's not just connecting health and social services, um, but reminding people of their own capacity to have self-determination in the process, right? And that's Health Promotion 101, taking more control over the conditions for our health and well-being as individuals and as community members. So I see a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of energy, and a lot of potential around these approaches. Um, and because partly we're building in evaluation. So we get feedback about what's working, what's not. We can uh, evaluate and innovate and keep learning and growing. Um, and the more people do it, the more they want it. So I'm really optimistic about the future of this work across Canada. Follow up. Mm -hmm. What is this thing called? Does this have a name? I hear various terms used to describe this. Is there a settled upon terminology? For well, this? Um, I call it social prescribing. Uh, many people do, and I think that's most accessible to the vast majority of people. We kind of know what social is. We understand what prescribing is. But yet this is happening under many types of names across the country. What distinguishes social prescribing from community services that are already offered, for example, um, is that focus on the self-determination of people and communities? Um, and is the systematic approach to the referral and to learning about the impacts on health and health equity outcomes for people? Um, because like we sort of vaguely think is food is good for us and saves us money in the health system, but we haven't tracked that in Canada. We don't know for sure. Um, so it's the measurement, it's the self-determination, um, and it's that very systematic and intentional approach that distinguishes social prescribing from some of the existing services that we have. So trying to knit some of those together in a more systematic way is what social prescribing is all about. Is that what you call it too? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do, uh, you know, have the, the support of the social prescribing. I think as Kate has very powerfully said, I think for me in some ways, from my vantage point, as a physician, I'm a little bit... I think the P word on prescribing is really important. I think it gets the um, the kind of profile to this 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 kind of topic. But I'm also very mindful, as Kate has mentioned, around the dynamics. I don't want there to be a healthcare or hospital overreach. And again, there's a lot of expertise that we have in communities that have been pushing us to the healthcare system that is so far behind where communities have been about what makes people healthy, what matters to them. So I, I love to see the movement and the optimism. And I think for me, it's always just a reminder from a place of humility that it's not me as a physician actually doing the prescribing. Mm -hmm. It's for us and our team, we're building community health workers, as Kate has mentioned, who are actually doing the guiding, the supporting, and the accompaniment. So that's the only sort of, uh, you know, not caveat, but I think a context I would provide on it because I think people are quick to believe it's as simple as me on my prescription pad to write food. That's not the process <laughs> and food RX, but there's a whole system. And as Kate has mentioned, this stitching together, this element of health equity being at the root of it, that I would never want to be discounted by, you know, any sort of title. I don't think you'll ever have a perfect title for this work, but I think Kate has captured that really well about all those dynamics. 
Okay, thanks. So next up on the list is is Josh, and Josh is one of the people I'm most interested to hear from be on a panel about food as medicine, because Josh is from Newfoundland, where bologna remains a major food group. Um, so um, he's been active in trying to fix that out there. So Josh, what's your what's your high level take on this? Issue? First, to be clear, I am not trying to remove bologna from anyone. Um, <laughs> Given that we're at an event with, with Maple Leaf, we have to mention that. <laughs> also, that the, the, the mascot that attracts the most attention at the Christmas parade in St. John's is, is the giant walking bologna stick. So uh, we have a complicated relationship here. Um, <laughs> but I, so where I'm coming from this, uh, I, I'm the CEO of, of a community organization that is, we're trying to navigate our own how, thinking on how do we fit into this conversation and and what parts of this work do we really want to endorse and so I, I'm very happy to be as part of this group because I think this is going to help me resolve some some complex conversations amongst our staff too we're really thinking through a lot of it so our organization our mission is to advance everyone's right to food and so how does this conversation sit there and I think it does um, we have seen, and I'm not sure how many, how familiar folks are with the landscape of kind of health policy in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, to be blunt, it's a bit of a garbage fire. You know, like uh, we, even more than other provinces, have a structurally unsustainable health system that uh, it cannot continue as is. Um, you know, we just, it's, it's not possible. And then one of the things that's happened out our way in the last little while is that more than in many other places, I think we've started to deal with that kind of head on. So I had the privilege of sitting on the province's health accord task force. And so this task force was uh, mostly high level health leadership. I was actually the only kind of community person on it. Um, but it, it was mostly high level health leadership tasked with reimagining what healthcare looks like in Newfoundland and Labrador. And what the report comes back with is that we cannot reimagine healthcare, we have to reimagine health, right? That we cannot possibly fix what's structurally wrong with our healthcare system without addressing the determinants behind it, right? Uh, you know, we could have the Cadillac version of a healthcare system and it would still be a garbage fire because those social determinants beneath it are, are just pointing all in the wrong direction, right? Uh, and so, we see out of that report, for example, that you have a report on health policy who one of its top line recommendations is a guaranteed basic income. Uh, and so what do we do with that? Uh, I don't think our system is super well set up yet to have these conversations about where health policy and social policy are really the same thing. And one thing I find really interesting about the, the idea of food as medicine is starting to dissolve those lines, right? Because it's an we make this artificial division between what is capital H health and, and what's social policy. And you end up, if you're in a job like mine, often seeing valuable initiatives getting ping-ponged between the government departments that are responsible for one or the other because we can't agree whether something is a social or a health intervention. And that's just a, a waste of time of a conversation. And I, I think here, when we're thinking about how does the health system and how does food as medicine sit, um, I look at this as a community practitioner also, as, as, as I think many of community folks should, is where is the money in our social system? To be blunt, uh, we spend far more on, on health expenditures than social expenditures. And it, one of the, I think, most um, damning things I saw as part of the healthcare, uh, the health accord task force was a little chart that showed for the past couple of decades, health spending in our province has gone up by 236% and social spending has gone up by 6%. And so if we're in a situation where that is the reality that we're building from a policy perspective, we're not gonna get anywhere. And, and I think that's the lens that I am bringing maybe to this conversation, thinking about where in that system are there resources that could be better put to use and how do we stimulate that conversation, which is not, I would say, uh, a, a native conversation for most folks in health to start talking about resources from that system going into preventative interventions, right? Uh, and so I, I'll be the first to say I have some skepticism around social prescription or food prescription. I think there, there are some red lines for me as a, as a practitioner here. And one would be, I don't ever want to be in a situation where government comes to me and says, we've solved food insecurity. You can just go and get your food prescription now. And I, not to say that I think that we're there, but I think that's one of the thing, the, the lines that we need to walk in this conversation is, uh, can we 
uh, rebuild our health and social system, however they intersect, in a way that's going to make people's lives better now, while also not getting in the way of those kind of big picture shifts that are really social policy shifts at the, at the far end, income shifts, right? Uh, so I, I think that's some of the conversation that I'm glad to have here. The last thing I'll mention, just because we're talking about food as medicine, I think it is important to note that most of the time we are talking about income, we're talking about people who, who we're trying to create spaces for them to have some agency and choice. But there's also food insecurity of folks within the healthcare system. So uh, there are folks who are eating what they eat because they're in a healthcare institution. Uh, and there's lots of people right now who are in healthcare institutions, long-term care hospitals, who are food insecure. Not in like a caloric sense, they're getting enough calories for their bodies, but are they getting the food that makes sense for them? Are they getting the food that's culturally meaningful for them? We're doing a lot of work uh, with part indigenous partners in Labrador around this. And you know, I wouldn't say that an elder who comes down from Nain for the first time to Goose Bay to long-term care and is fed spaghetti uh, is food secure in a meaningful way. And so when we're talking about food as medicine, I also think there's a layer to this about thinking about within our healthcare system in those places where, where patients don't have a lot of choice about what food is being placed on their plate, that we have a conversation about how to get the, the best therapeutic value out of that. And that's that's kind of a layer to this that I think connects to this conversation. And I wanted to, to name here uh, because it's, you know, food insecurity manifests in different in different places. So I'll stop there. I think maybe that's a bit of context from, from out our way, if that's helpful, David. Absolutely. Who knew they served spaghetti in hospitals? I know, hey. Um, Catherine? Okay, please forgive me my notes, but I get so excited and overwhelmed with confu like, you know, excitement and confusion at the same time. I could go very deep down a rabbit hole if I don't have something to keep me on track because we're working really deeply in this in this topic and I and I have lots to say and and um, it'll ultimately keep me shorter so uh, that's good um, so first of all, I'll just say that community food centers Canada is an organization uh, our vision uh, obviously is an organization that's 10 years old um, national organization that our vision is to is a Canada where every Canadian has the means knowledge and opportunity to access good food. Um, and we have four areas of our work. We build community food centers with partners across Canada. We support the capacity of our sector, which is basically the grassroots food security movement, 400 organizations with training and coaching and that kind of thing. We innovate in the area of health promotion, and that's where this interest and in the work that we do here fits. And finally, we do advocacy mostly on poverty reduction and food insecurity, um, trying to target the national level. So we we have a slightly different approach in that we keep these things so somewhat separate in our minds around the health promotion and the poverty reduction and food insecurity. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so we all know that it's unjust and unhealthy that so many people can't put food on the table and the stress, the toll on their physical and mental health and the stigma of lacking food or having to resort to food charity. This is the background of why we do this, all of this work and, and this particular work around what I would call, a, um, I call it a healthy food prescription, which is I see as a subset of social prescribing. So social prescribing is like the whole thing that that you do to, you know, outside of the box of conventional uh, physician care. Um, and then the healthy food prescription is, is one piece of that. Um, and it, but it is also this sort of elephant in that uh, equation, because to do that, to actually at any kind of meaningful level, will cost a lot of money. Cost, I think, a lot more money than other, some other aspects of social prescribing. And um, But if we're to get beyond the grassroots um, invention of this, which is what we've been working on for seven years, we're going to have to have some fairly significant investments. So um, that's, uh, yeah, I'll come back to that too. Um, so on the one hand, uh, increase for incomes for people to meet their basic needs would be would even out the health outcomes across the socioeconomic spectrum eventually without any specific investment in food, because that's just how it seems to work. Like if you have you know, more resources, you will do better. And you're eventually all of the factors that the, the complex factors that result in health will, will even out. Um, and so we. Um, we keep our focus on, you know, policy-wise, I mentioned on um, poverty reduction for that reason. Um, and so we work on tax credits for working age adults, for example, or trying to effectively create a basic income through the tax system, through different demographic groups and so on. So that's kind of where the fault, our policy work uh, focuses. But this poverty reduction thing, it's kind of intractable and kind of a long-term project. And um, 
it as his food insecurity is a subset of that. So, you know, progress being made, it's been mentioned, um, it's incremental. But the thing is, is that for people in communities that in the absence of having adequate income, their food budget is the most flexible part of their of their income. So they'll have to buy poor quality food, resort to emergency food pe programs, skip meals, and so on. Um, so, you know, a, fu a fruit and vegetable prescription in that context could be a way to protect that part of the budget for food in situations like that. Um, if it were part of, uh, you know, uh, or additional to other uh, assistance programs. Um, and the other thing is that we actually do have diet-related disease across the, the socioeconomic spectrum, not just amongst low-income people, though it is worse for, for those folks. Um, so, you know, it could... Um, Sorry, I lost my logic there, my train of thought for a second. But um, what it, they, the factors, though, at that level is that people are unable to prevent or address the issues as they arise in their, in their health. Um, so we, as commu at Community Food Centers Canada, were aware of the work that was being done in the U.S. It's being referenced. Um, uh, SNAP and Double Up Bucks, the women and children uh, recipients of um, re uh, benefits that could be uh, cash in at farmers markets. And we saw the, the rise of the wholesome wave movement in the US as big, big foundation that has been doing this work. Um, so we were also aware that the conditions in Canada are different. We have a different healthcare system. We have different stakeholders in that system. And so that we thought that to translate into our context, um, you know, we'd need to investigate the different uh, in, you know, ways into those systems, develop our own case and evidence here, and look at how we would deliver a program at any sort of scale. Um, community health centers, creating a pathway for uh, families, women with single parents of, of young kids to get access to their markets, and we saw some good results there. And then about three years ago with Public Health Agency of Canada funding, combined with Maple Leaf Centre funding and Arrow Fa Family Foundation fun funding, we uh, rolled out a fairly significant size uh, project to um, with 28 partners across Canada. Um, and to, to start testing this uh, on the ground. Each partner was tasked with finding their own referral path, like their own prescription path, um, to select people who are both insecure and um, either suffering from or at serious risk for diet-related disease. And the prescription could be redeemed at the market, the subsidized market, which was also supported through the project. Um, additionally, as part of the project, we are working with St. Mike's Inner City Health in Toronto to offer a, to offer to develop a clinical trial that will actually look at the um, biometric results of having a prescription to fruits and vegetables. So helping to further build the case, we hope. So um, uh, just a little bit of a snapshot of, from our 55-page report, evaluation report, um, which nobody really wants to hear all of, all of, but there's so much in there and I can gladly share it. Um, so we just re received the results from the first um, thousand or from a thousand people who were involved in the first cohort over two years. Um, and 745 of those people were people who received a prescription versus those who just stopped, shopped at the subsidized markets. Um, and so looking at the most rigorous comparisons, the pre-post, 75% uh, of the recipients reported statistically significant changes in their fruit and vegetable consumption, with 73% of those maintaining those changes after three months, which I think is kind of a special thing about the evaluation that we did, was looking at what, what lasts, like what happens after it's over. Um, partly though, they can continue to to access the markets, so uh, that's one factor. But in real terms, that means that they went from eating fruit and vegetables in the three-day prior period from 20, uh, 18 times to 25 times. So that gives you a sense of what, what the results really mean on the, um, in their diet. So 31% showed an uh, improvement in food insecurity at the end of the, um, the intervention, but I mean, you know, if you give people food, they'll have food, right? We know that. And so at the three month point, people will were the pre and post people to their prior food security status. Um, 54% uh, rated their own health as um, better and 64% of those sustained that um, improved health afterwards. And then just something that I know Kate is interested in is how much like just stress and the health impacts of stress. And 34% uh, scored better on stress measures uh, afterwards and 64% maintained that. So 
just quickly, um, we're looking to scale. We always have tried to keep in mind scale and it's time to do that now. Like we have proved this at the grassroots here. Um, the, the, Eval the evaluation and the research in the U.S. shows diabetes reduction, you know, in real terms. There's all sorts of evidence. Um, I think there's, we do need to do some work though to find who wants to pay for this. I mean, the amount of which level of government, which health authority will see the benefit um, in terms of cost reduction or, you know, uh, will align with their strategy because we know that the scale of impact will be matched with the scale of funding and sustainability. It just stands to reason, right? Um, otherwise, we're just going to keep it starting and finishing and you know people are going to start programs and programs it's just going to go on forever um we need to find pathways for actual prescriptions in systems because we found that when people had to make it up themselves it was hard it's really hard to invent it for every community organization we need to find uh, an actual payment system to deliver it a grocery card or some way that it will enable people to go broader than just community organizations if we want to scale it and then um yeah i think we, we've got enough like Logic, evidence, inference, all of it to tell us that this is time to start doing this now. Thank you, Catherine. So that's a, that's a good place to jump off to in this group. So we've got, we're in Ottawa, we've got people from the government here, we've got officials here, we're at Canada 2020, which basically runs the government. So <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a good opportunity, and I'm just going to throw this out to the group of you and jump in. Yeah. What is the ask of government here? Like, what is, like, these are practical people. They need to go back to their offices, do some work. Um, do you have an idea that you want some level of government to do something right now? Okay. I do. Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, yes. I mean, I think there are a couple of things that are really important. I think one thing I wanted to say, too, about the, the, um, the idea that this is expensive. Um, there's been some really good recent modeling in the U.S. context showing that even a 30% subsidy on healthy food at the population scale would save $100 billion a year in the U.S. economy. Even if we're 10% of that, that's a significant savings. And those are primarily, almost exclusively, health systems costs. So um, actually, it's quite inexpensive <laughs> and cost savings to do this, but we have to think uh, in that sort of well-being budgeting way across different line ministries. Otherwise, the investments and the uh, returns on investment don't accrue in the same places, and it's difficult. So I encourage everyone to try to work together across ministries to do this. So I think we need, we need to think about this realistically as a health intervention. Um, and when we compare it to other health work, it's easier to see the benefit than if we compare it to other community work um, that in some ways might be way further advanced, but is very unstably funded and underfunded. So it's invest. It's prevention work. And, and the record yeah. shows that Canadians are actually not that interested in the government spending money on health care prevention. They're very interested in the government spending money on health care treatments. Prevention, that's supposed to be up to you. Yeah, well, yeah, the one thing I'd jump in on then maybe on this, and I do think there's a, a bit of a false debate and choice on this issue. And I think being in Ottawa, it's 20, I keep thinking it's 2020, but it's Ottawa 2023. Um, so great branding. But I think uh, if we go back to Minister Mark Lewand in 1974 in Ottawa being here, all of this was laid out within 10 years of having an acute care system of Medicare. And if you reread Lalonde's report, who then was a Minister of Health and Social Welfare, which by argument then was actually much more integrated to Kate's point about ministries working together, this issue about poverty reduction, to how this injures food insecurity to primary care. All this was laid out in 74. It's been close to 50 years that we have completely diverged from the recommendations from Lalonde. And it's those same people. So, if, you know, it's, it's a thread that comes through. It's 6 million people, as Sarah mentioned, without with food insecurity. It's now 6 million people that access to primary care the same number of people who are food and uh, housing insecure. So that element of this common denominator of poverty and the prescription then in 74 to invest upstream. But I, I do think there's two pieces. One, on a tangible thing that could be done, if you look at other OECD countries, we are one of the only ones without a national food school program. There's no school food program. And I think those are tangible things that could be done. We're also you know well behind to talk about upstream solutions on social housing, uh, which is so connected to food insecurity. I can only think of it last week when I was in uh, at the Shell uh, Clinic. I had a patient and I asked what would be, you know, has been waiting for years, now have a nine-year wait list for housing in Toronto. What is it about getting housing that would, and his answer was to hear himself 
the sizzle of cooking again and living in the shelter system, not being able to do that. And we talk about food and the meeting and the dignity. Uh, if we even doubled the OECD uh, spend on housing, we'd be at the average of OECD countries. So I think it's important. I think what happens is this argument is, well, we pay too much for healthcare. We could move it to spending. Look at the OECD averages. We are not at the top when it comes to public spend of OECD countries on the public expenditure. Again, we're in a room in Ottawa 2023 with no pharmacare, no real access publicly home care, issues around long-term care. So our public provision of a spend is actually well behind the OECD average. And that same element of where we have the failures about access to food and the income security pieces that need to be paid for. So I think that's an element on healthcare and on the social spend. We spend less than other countries. There was a great paper uh, in the Journal of American Medicine in 2018 that I think upends if people want to look at how well we rank on social spending, on food insecurity, housing, and income to some of our OECD average. We've been held back in this paradigm freeze of being beside the United States. And then the great points made that the policy environment in the U.S. is more dynamic, that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid are actually paying for food, paying for these food prescriptions because they reduce hospital readmissions by 49%. They reduce costs by 20%. It's good, you know, a back to the aphorism of, you know, ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure. Our payers, payers in the United States get that. Our payers here haven't realized that. And every single time it's these same millions of people, the same racialized low-income communities that are bearing the brunt of poor health outcomes. And we can do RCT after RCT. We're going to have the same outcome. You, we've done RCT on housing. People had better health. We've done an RCT on get people access to medications. Guess what? They took their medications. We'll do an RC, we've done evaluations on getting people access to food. They'll take them and the outcomes will be better. I think that's the distress and the desperation we're in. And we have a situation where kids in school do not have a national program. And so where can you start? I think there's a myriad of options. Josh, I mean, you're on the ground on this in, in Newfoundland. Surely this is, and you talked about working with your with your premier and on the health accord, et cetera. Surely this is, in our system, a provincial responsibility, this program. Sure, but healthcare, the dollars are not all provincial. One, there's there's a conversation about health and social transfers. And I, I want to push back a little bit on what you said about um, kind of public attitudes towards prevention. I, not that I, I don't disagree that the public's attitudes are what they are. But one, but one thing that we saw when we were going through this process of talking to the public about healthcare in, in our province was that... Um, it's really powerful to level with people. And I don't think as in general, we're very clear with the public about the fundamental structural gaps and unsustainability of our healthcare system. Uh, and one thing I was, I found really interesting was sitting in on these sessions and consultations and things. Once you lay the problem out to people, they got it, right? And I think we don't trust people enough sometimes to really understand what the issue is and, and, and you know, like, uh, to understand where things are balancing in terms of like Andrew was saying around the around the spend or even just what is the balance in our own jurisdiction. So like as an example, where I live, um, we have like lots of other jurisdictions. There's a healthy food basket that's been costed out. So what would it cost for a family of four to eat, you know, minimally nutritious Canada Food Guide diet for 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 a week? Um, if you're living on income support in Newfoundland and Labrador, you'd spend 93 percent of your check to buy that basket. Right. Uh, that's a statistic that once people see that, they think, OK, this is something that's, again, structurally unsustainable. Right. And, and however we get at that. Uh, and so I, I, I do think I don't want to discount the fact that there's um, there's a possibility to move the public on this. And I do think in terms of, you know, what's the ask here? It is to to broaden what is what we're considering to be a healthcare conversation, right? So, Kate, you raised the kind of whole of government or, or um, you know, well-being budgeting approaches. Like one thing that's happening at, uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador right now, we have a deputy minister of health transformation who isn't in the Department of Health, which I think is actually a pretty good first step, right? Because his job is now to convince the minister of transportation that they are also a minister for health. That there are, you know, that there are all these pieces to this. So I think there's some uh, some structural things we can do to break down some of the the decision making that happens around this, uh, and and that makes a difference in terms of getting to 
making whatever this intervention looks like, making it a bit more sustainable at the other end. Because I agree, like to your point, Catherine, we don't want to be in the situation where you're in an endless role of, of pilots and trials and things like that. We want to, uh, and nor do we want to say that this is a permanent solution, but there's something in between there, right? And, and, and we're not there yet, but I think we can get there. Catherine, is, is this a, from your perspective, is, is this an imperfect or stopgap solution to a larger problem? I mean, when I hear everybody talking here, to me, they're talking about poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, if you, if the country was bringing in a guaranteed income, mm -hmm. basic income, would you still need this program? Or is this a, an attempt to get some money or food into people's hands in us through the side door. I mean, is this a is this a unique thing that would exist under any circumstance, mm -hmm. or is this a sneaky way of income support? Hmm. <laughs> it's so hard for me to imagine that that ideal future in which people actually had an adequate basic income. Because even if they had a basic income, getting to people like to a livable income, that's the that's the tricky part, right? Like because when we look at a basic income and what's being proposed, it tends to be about half of what you might need as an actual income. So I don't really foresee this being a real like a real, uh, you know, question. So no, it's not a sneaky way. I'd rather actually address the, the, the issue head on and get, you know, people adequate income and, and really shine a light on how inadequate it is now. And then, but then also recognize it in this, like this, all of these gaps for all of the foreseeable future. There's going to be this time where people are going to have to compromise their diet, the diets that they need for their health um, because they won't be able to prioritize. It's, you know, it's not cheap to eat, all the fruits and vegetables that you need, all, you know, get all the, the good healthy food and so on. So I don't see it uh, like as, as just, and I would be very like, just really want to be so clear that we don't want governments to be able to say, well, this is expensive, but it's cheap compared to what we need to do to fix incomes. Right. And so on our food security checklist, we look at what we've done. Right. So we don't like, that would be a very bad outcome. I don't, you know, again, it's all very hypothetical, but uh, not something that we would like to see. We need to keep these things separate. But, you know, health uh, health input should get a health outcome. And in terms of prevention, I think we did a poll. I, I'm just remembering in the misty reaches of memory, we did a poll about 10 years ago about a whole bunch of food things. And I don't, like, we saw a lot of support for these types of programs. I don't think the public doesn't get it. I think you know, it's hard for health policymakers because the ROI is not as direct and clear. It's longer term. It's a behemoth. It's hard to turn the ship around. All these things. Think a little differently. Sure. Um, just, you know, on the, um, you know, there's a, there, there has become a very powerful paradigm in food work that it's really just about income. Um, but it's about more. Um, and so even if we have great public policies, and I'm a geographer, and I know that we need to work at multiple scales, right? Uh, but those scales have to include the community, right? So even with um, adequate access to income and other big social policies that are critical infrastructure for doing this, we still need community-based health approaches. And we don't invest in those. And we don't even recognize that they're part of our healthcare system. Um, even though we know that, you know, if caregivers took away their unpaid labor, the whole health system would collapse by noon on the first day. Um, there, there's significant work that still needs to happen there. And as to um, investing in prevention, for the vast majority of us, that ship has already sailed. We know that food prescribing can help with treatment and management, and we can also focus on that. Um, you know, uh, I'm conscious of the fact that there's a lot of people who work in government in this room. And when one of you, I think it might have been you, Kate, so I'll give you a mulligan. Um, <laughs> when, when, one, when one of you said that it doesn't cost any money because it will pay for itself and reduce medical care costs, you know, that's my not exactly what I said. Um, I'm pretty sure I didn't say it didn't cost anybody. Everybody any money. in government is used to people coming to them and saying, my yeah. program won't cost any money because it costs money up front, of course, but then it pays for itself. All programs that get pitched to government yeah. pay for itself. So if that's true, you're going to have to prove it. If it's not true, you're going to have to start coming up with a cost number yep. that you ask people to, to pay for. There's a lot of econometric modeling that's going on, though, in the U.S. in particular, because they it's, it's just a massive, a massive movement there. We're not just like... Yeah, you know the battery plant's going to create 30,000 jobs, eh? <laughs> you know, right? But we're, like, we didn't just invent this today sitting here. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so yeah. So the, I mean, I think that that modeling has been done. You you mentioned some of it. Like you know, it's not too hard to to you know go all on the jump along the lily pad from and you know both using common sense and actual evidence, right? From better food to this this disease. You know, we know these connections well. Then we can model how much money will be saved. We know how much it costs to treat diabetes. We know how much it costs to you know admit somebody to emergency with a with a cardiovascular situation. So it, it's very. I think it's pretty pretty easy to do that math. It's just math. We can we can figure it out. Andrew, you want to say something? Yeah, I think it's, it's also even beyond the econometrics and the math modeling is the issue that what we're talking about is irreversible costs of the fact that millions of kids in our country are going without food, right? Like, I think that's the part of it. I don't think we've been as clear to policymakers mm -hmm. about what essentially we're talking about. I think people can debate the methodology and poverty lines and how long will it take to get a return on our investment and the political cycle is four years and we won't see a return on that till seven or eight. The reality is that you know, whether it's about the chronic disease or cancer rates and other acute care uh, issues that are coming up, there are millions of children now that do not have access to food mm -hmm. and their parents or their families are making impossible decisions about renewing Medicaid. It's the same one in 10 about medication, the same about the groceries. Yeah. And I think, again, the rebate, the grocery rebate is one step to acknowledge that situation, but clear that we need so much more. And the same around what's happening with millions of people being housing insecure in the country. So I think the clarity of if children continue also to go and families without access to nutritious food, no matter what you decide to spend in 20, 30 years from now, you're not going to reverse those longstanding and very uh, concrete and sticky health conditions that no matter what we try to bring are going to be there. And that is a huge uh, cost to yeah. the quality adjusted life years, these metrics that we use, but I hope we can actually capture when we're talking about families, low-income families and children in this case, and hopefully that, I mean, you are the political, you know, expert on this, but I don't know how simple uh, and grave this situation can be. In Ottawa, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got the methodology, so I'll give it to you. Um, I want to just stick with you for a second, Andrew, because um, you're the doctor and I'm confused about something. I mean, we're talking about this as uh, a part of the healthcare system, as something that alleviates future healthcare costs. We're using a term like prescriptions, yeah. but I understand that we're really not talking about something delivered by the healthcare system here. We're really not talking about a physician prescribed amount of food that you then take to some place like it, it is uh there are models running that are well outside the healthcare system right and doing this at a community level without healthcare intervention what is the model again trying to help people here get their arms around this thing yeah what is the what is the model is this an extension of food banks or is this an extension of the healthcare system yeah it's, it's a great question i think kate has you know offered some really great context i think from my perspective on this again i've said some you know, I'm in about the P word being prescribing because I think there's some fascination again with, you know, me or a colleague writing on a prescription pad that this will result in, again, a magical outcome or a better outcome. Again, when we're talking about the desperation healthcare system. But to me, the P word is really about partnership in this. And I think that has been said in terms of where the health and social systems have to be working. It goes back to 74 about a health and social welfare ministry. I mean, can you imagine that? Where, where I work at Toronto General, if you go up the street, David, there's a Ministry of Health, a Ministry of Mental Health, a Ministry of Long-Term Care, a Ministry of Community and Social Services, and a Ministry of Municipal Housing and Affairs. All five now ministries to deal with the same individual I talked about who was talking about being unable to have housing to cook their own meal. So I think there's a huge silo and fragmentation. We've talked about how complex the healthcare system is. And this has worked back to the Hastings Report on Community Health Centers, 70 Global Lawn Report. It's about the integration. And again, I want to be clear that it's not, uh, we didn't talk about the training in medical school to actually help navigate or prescribe people to what is the best, for example, food bank or food agency that's in place. It's with community health workers, other folks that are now part of the team to be a staple of health and social care. And I think that's a huge learning, I hope, because it's hard to see some of the lapses we've had coming through the pandemic of how we have to think differently and how our healthcare system is being delivered. And I think Kate had mentioned this, pre-pandemic, large acute care hospitals did not partner with community health centers. 
And now that's happening in a scale for the vaccine roll that we've not seen before. We can't lose that connective tissue. And I think it's in very real people that were the community health ambassadors, community health workers who can now take whatever prescription or recommendation, work with them and have their own expertise as to how that person can navigate the social system that'll best work for them. But the challenge is that prescription doesn't mean much if the public policy system is faltering. A community health worker can't magically create housing, can't magically get them into a food bank with now six servings as opposed to two. So we have to, and I think this has been great from the panel of this on the ground and also 30,000 public policy conversation that you need to see happening in concert. Right. Anybody else on the panel, what model would you like to see people in government considering here? I, yeah, I have a, a couple of thoughts on that because we're trying to think this out on the ground in, uh, in Newfoundland Labrador right now. I mean, I, I think um, lots of the provinces are moving towards more uh, team-based healthcare models. So like out our way, for example, the the, where we're headed is that you won't have a family doctor. You'll be a, a patient of a healthcare team. That would be, and, and you know, this is not just a Newfoundland Labrador conversation, right? Uh, and I think like there is a place for this conversation when I'm not attached to a GP anymore. I'm attached to a team that includes social workers, nutritionists, dietitians, OTs, the, yeah. this broader scope of practice. So I think there's it's easier to envision what we're talking about here in the context of your relationship to healthcare being a relationship with that, not with a all powerful GP. Right. Who I think rightly uh, I would have some nervousness about that, you know, like lots of people don't have uh, maybe the most empowering relationship with their family doctor. But that's not what I think any of these models are really talking about. Um, I also maybe just to take a step back for a second, like we need to think about where we are when we're talking public policy about food access. Because this conversation is a lot more nuanced than the conversation that's gone before, which has typically been about food banks, right? And, mm -hmm. and about emergency relief in the most, uh, oh, I think my mic cut it there, um, emergency relief in the most kind of basic way, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, over the, over the pandemic and in the early pandemic, we saw government aid primarily flowing to established food charities, right? And that, like, structurally has even more limitations than this right so i think the other piece of it is that there's uh, by bringing the food conversation into the health conversation we also recognize that there's there's loads of people who will never access uh, a food charity you know we know that the vast majority of food well wait let me just let me just stop yeah. you it's only about 30 percent who yep. do exactly right? right so so food banks are not remotely touching them yeah. the large majority of people that need help right exactly. now help so why would this be different so uh, i think the healthcare system touches more of them right and one of the one of the things to think about is like no door the wrong door right if for you as someone who is food insecure now if going to the food bank makes sense for you in your life go to food bank but there's lots of folks who that's not true for but maybe they do have a pathway through their through their their healthcare team right so i i think from a community perspective i in the in that kind of short term like helping people cope with some terrible things in their lives, you want to make sure that every door they walk through, mm -hmm. they can get some kind of help. And that's just not mm -hmm. true right now. Uh, mm -hmm. By and large, you're interacting with the healthcare system and people just throw up their hands because there's not that connection. And so that can change, right? Right. Uh, lots of thoughts on the, the, the direction for program design. Um, you know, given what we've learned and what we've seen with our community partners, I mean, I think it does need to get out of the community sector, be it food banks, be it community food centers, no matter, no matter what, like whatever solutions we try to invent at the grassroots are always just too partial. We just don't have enough resources. So it does need to live in the healthcare system. It does need to, to reach scale. You know, we, we do need to have, we need to intersect with the mainstream uh, food system as well, like with grocery retailers, we need a card that's portable that can go. Ideally, it would be one, and it does exist in the U.S. I'm not just dreaming. Um, and where you know that could be used anywhere from a farmers market to like a, a Sobeys or a or a Loblaws or whatever. But if you want to reach people, you know, where they shop and in their patterns, and that's what you're going to have to do. So, and then you need a healthcare system that will work. And, you know, we were talking about team dietitian. Like, I think that's effectively what we're saying with the family family health team. Um, you know, the, in Ontario, the community health centers, we don't have them in every province, but they'd be an awesome system because they reach a lot of lower income people. They're just, they're just great resources. And they have that, that's where we've seen the most success and the pathways, the shortest between right now, the redemption at a, maybe a market or whatever, and, and the doctor or the dietitian or the social worker who screens a person for the 
for the health condition, for the food insecurity, you know, who can who can identify the people who are food insecure, and then off you go. But yeah, those I, I think that that that's where we're pointing if we want to go to scale. Cool. All right. I think this has been a really interesting overview. Let's bring the audience into this for a few minutes before we wrap up. You had a question. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is uh, Ama, um, the executive director at Sea Change, uh, which is uh, formerly USC Canada, based here in Ottawa. Um, as 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 you were all talking, I kept thinking back to the special diet program, the provincial, the Ontario provincial special diet program, and I'm wondering if you can maybe share a little bit around what makes this different from the special diet program. And if there's been any studies on the impact of the special diet program, I know the amounts that, you know, families can receive is only up to $250 a month. And we know with the cost of grocery right now, that would not get you anywhere, really. So I'm just curious if you have some thoughts on, you know, the food prescription program and how that's different or what learnings are we taking from that special diet program to kind of inform some of these um, um, conversations as well. Thank you. Who wants to go? Well, I, I remember the, the special, I mean, we worked so much on the special diet program when I, back before Community Food Centers Canada at the stop, and it was a time when we were working to leverage that as much as possible for diet, diet related disease, through, but it's through disability that it's delivered, right? And as soon as people started, like doctors started prescribing it more broadly, and as soon as it got more expensive, the government basically pushed back and shrank it. And and like some doctors almost lost their licenses. I mean, it was a big, it was a big thing, right? Because, you know, uh, they were trying to expand it beyond just the most like strict form of disability. So it seems to have that you know, it's it's only going to grow as big as the government wants to spend the money in that area. Um, it's also was delivered as just an income supplement, which is a good thing. It's great. Um, and it was like in order to go buy the food. But I think to maybe to get the buy in from the from the healthcare stakeholders, we're going to have to have a more a more direct connection between the healthy food in and the and the result that you want out. And that would be not just through an income supplement but through, which, and don't get me wrong, income supplements are great from wherever we get them, however we get them. But, you know, for this program, I think it's healthy food in, healthy outcomes out. And that's the difference. Andrew? Yeah, and as someone who's sadly, uh, you know, memorized a special diet form, I do think we haven't, be very can I don't want forms. Uh, I think the, as Catherine has mentioned, I think it's also very much reactive. It's for people who are obviously with disability on social assistance or Ontario works. Uh, and I don't think we've scaled the learnings and I've not seen any uh, robust evaluations of it, but I can tell you it is probably one of the most meaningful things I can do as a physician uh, for folks in my practice when they're there with, again, impossible choices. So I think the linkage is clear. And again, I think we have just failed to pick up the system learnings. And I think it's a a failure on the healthcare system writ large. Okay, if we're super tight, we can squeeze two more questions in here. Let's go. Mine will be really, mine will be really quick. I uh, I canceled my one o'clock thing. This is way too interesting. So I just want to thank the panel for uh, right. for your your awesome insights. So like a lot of people, I've observed going into the grocery store that uh, that unhealthy food has tended to stay about the same cost. A, a bag of potato chips at Fresh Coast still a dollar fifty. Uh, a can of Chef Boyardee is is still a dollar fifty. Uh, seasonal vegetables are more expensive, so I really really perked up when I heard. Um, I think Kate, you said that subsidizing healthy food. So beyond a, a school food program, a national school food, school food program, which we we're working on, uh, and and we've committed to. What are other ways that the government could subsidize healthy foods? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, uh, it, it, the modeling has happened. I don't think the policy uh, landscape has really happened, uh, even in the U.S. context. But I think there are definitely opportunities through accountable care approaches to health, um, where, you know, those who are delivering health are accountable for health outcomes and health services outcomes. And so I would look to, for example, the provincial health transfers. Uh, and I know there are big challenges around accountabilities and what strings can be attached, but I think there is an important role for the federal government um, to really attach those to, to delivering on, on, on outcomes. And why has the U.S., um, which we know has huge challenges in its healthcare landscape, 
been more advanced than we are on some of these social interventions. It's because they have to be accountable, accountable for those health outcomes, which are more than 50% of which are determined by social and structural determinants. So if they don't act on those, they're not going to see the outcomes. So that's uh, that kind of a uh, model uh, is going to be really important for when we think about future federal invest investments in provincial systems. And I totally agree on the Accountable Care Act and the Obamacare piece and the, the policy dynamic. Just one thing I think specifically to the question, we've seen a lot of great work from Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler and others as economists about mm. the nudge and placement aspects. So I think to be very concrete, I think there are measures that yeah. the government can be taking with the private sector on the placement and not only the subsidization, but where foods are placed. There was great evaluations on the UK, like the, the placement tickets. of healthy foods how that's actually being, uh, the choice architecture is being developed yeah. in places, wh whichever grocery store you're at. I think those are accountabilities that can be put in place for the private sector and I think could be done relatively easy without a major spend. And, and there's a, a robust amount of evidence on how that can work on choice architecture. I got one more little piece for this, just to throw in that. I think when we talk about food prices and subsidizing food prices, is it isn't all about what's on the sticker on the food, right? Like I mm -hmm. think a lot about transportation. You know, uh, the f food price is a piece of it, but we're all, you know, if you live in a rural community in Newfoundland, Labrador, and you'd have to spend $50 on gas to get to the nearest place where you could buy the food that you're looking for, then the sticker price is the issue, right? And so I, I think a lot yeah. about what can we do to make transportation work within community, between communities is a big piece of yeah. when we're talking about food prices, that's also what we're talking about. Yeah, just to build on that too, I think like there's a whole care economy yeah. that we need to invest in, right? And it, so much food work happens at the domestic level. It's very feminized. It happens with caregivers. We need to invest in community health to make any of this sustainable. Did you say caring or carrot? I thought I heard you I say. Heard for I heard the carrot. The carrot the community, economy like, would oh also be good. No, I meant care. That's got legs. That's got legs. Care. <laughs> the care. Right the carrot community. I like it. Instead of Gary, should have thought of that. In the 2018 election. <laughs> um, there's a question back there. Can you hear me? No. I, I'll <laughs> stick it on. It's not working. I will protect my voice. Uh, I'm a Swede from the beginning. In Sweden, you have a right to a square mm. meal at school every single day. Why don't we have that in Canada? Why have we taken away the home economics? where you learn the skills, how to cook, how to economize, mm -hmm. how to eat healthily. You can give all these beautiful boxes of healthy food. I've been teaching cooking at the schools. Kids don't have a clue how to use the food mm -hmm. or they bring it home and their parents don't know. So we need to go from the ground up to make a difference. And I think it's so important. And I've seen the rubbish that the kids bring in when I'm at Manor Park School teaching uh, the lunchtime little cooking club, they bring in plastic to eat, basically. It's awful. And the, the parents don't know better, maybe, and, or they think they can't afford it. So we need to just get this message out and get it from the ground up. That's my little point from a lowly community worker. <laughs> it, it's surprising, well, though, feeling, how, how much... I, I, I've, I've been feeling insecure about sweden my whole life <laughs> you know since they ran those commercials when i was a kid about how the average 60 year old swede was more fit than the 30 year old canadian so screw sweden but anyway <laughs> what, what, what what do you have to say to to that business about people don't know what to do with the food if they find well, there's it? a lot of different you know it's a yes and yes and you know a lot of the time right so there's sweet you know, i come out on all the fronts but what i'm always really surprised at is how much of uptake there is on just providing like there's what you call pent-up demand let's say for healthy food um lots of people know that they should be could be eating better and the moment they have the opportunity to do they they take those vouchers they use them and then they say they they um learn more about like how to use the healthy food by just having the healthy food you got to use it you don't want to waste it sometimes obviously if it's in, if it's combined with some sort of um opportunity not you know, mandatory, but opportunity for nutrition education or cooking or whatever, that can be probably, that would be like the gold standard. It'd be amazing. If, and in health and in community centers, that can happen too. It can be part of the part of the program. But, you know, we see that people are not just like, that's why I'm so interested in, in the results from the evaluation. People are maintaining those results 
because of like a sort of a, a learning and a reprioritization, I think, in uh, having the opportunity to have those access to the healthy foods. And so three months later, they're still, it doesn't all just drop away the moment the subsidy ends, which sadly ours does because it's 20 weeks, right? And mm -hmm. it shouldn't be that way, but it doesn't just go away. They can continue to, you know, cook and say they're learning more about nutrition and food and so on. Excellent. Well, I think our time is up. I don't know uh, where Braden's going, but um, <laughs> are, are we are we keeping going or are we wrapping up? What's our deal here? Up. I think we've got to wrap up. Thank you very much, though. Yeah, it's, a quick one. it's a tremendous question. A massive social determinant of health with respect to food relates to the average Canadian's understanding of nutrition, metabolism, and related biochemistry. And this relates also to Dr. Andrew Guzzari's remark about violence prevention being accounted here, and also Dr. Kate Mulligan's references to personal agency. Are there any proposals that you both share with respect to amplifying, increasing the average level of understanding that Canadians have nutrition, which I view as terrible? And insofar as you define healthy eating, which has been referenced by, I think, every panelist multiple times, who is going to define the parameters of what constitutes helpful eating? Are there particular physicians or organizations or researchers that you folks want to share or consult with or trust? Or perhaps, Brady, you have some in mind that you think should be used as references or guideposts on how to define the parameters of healthy, because there's lots of this one comment, Centralizing planning and, and money and care won't matter at all if a person can't exercise agency if he or she is too uninformed or ignorant or just unarmed when approaching the grocery. They don't know what to buy. They don't know how to operate. Sorry, that's my tremendous question. <laughs> Thank you, Bart. I can take one piece of this. Uh, my usual reaction to that is the first step is Give those people some money so they have some time to think about themselves, right? Like, I think the biggest challenge with like with nutrition education, with this whole conversation, is that it's not that folks are are ignorant or uninformed. It's that they're busy. It's that someone is living in poverty and working seven precarious jobs. And if we sorted that person's life out, so maybe if they want to, they can think about what they're eating. Fine by me. But I, I'm a lot more comfortable sitting in the like, um, what can we do to open up options for people to then make the choice if if thinking about their nutrition is something that they want to do do for themselves. I think that's the better angle to take rather than to say, what can we do to, to capitally educate people? It's my position. We don't have to choose. Right. Andrew? Yeah, sorry, no, and, and I, an important point, I think, from uh, Josh on the, you know, poverty is a cognitive tax. Again, I think very mm -hmm. important in terms of how that uh, restricts people's ability to be able to make some of those choices. I think just, you know, directly on your question, I do think it's important, I think, because to, to unpack your question, that part of it was, well, where is there going to be some unbiased mm. science or the issues around nutrition and that kind of communication? And I'm hopeful that that is from the Public Health Agency of Canada and other folks where we do need to be more clear. And I think this is not to uh, stoke conspiracy theory, but the conflicts of interest are very important. There is papers published, again, in prestigious medical journals about how the food sector really essentially funded public health schools to push different out aspects around, you know, it was called big sugar at the time, lots of that work that it permeated uh, our own institutions uh, in terms of what was deemed healthy in the 80s and 90s. And it's a lot of work to undo some of the popular myths that were also driven by, quote unquote, uh, public health experts. So I think where there can be, and I think the Public Health Agency of Canada is well positioned to ensure that there's more of that science and understanding of the nutrition out there, those recommendations, and of course, any conflicts of industry, industry bias uh, have to either be disclosed or ensure that there's ways that uh, there can be trust in the recommendations that are there. But we have a lot of work to do. Uh, the schools of public health on this issue of nutrition have a very checkered past on this. And I think it's important we acknowledge it and be clear about a variety of different mediums and platforms and communication channels to ensure that the science and the best uh, recommendations around evidence-informed nutrition uh, are in place. Before this gets too nanny state, let me just be clear. <laughs> Poor people are allowed to eat chips still, right? Well, I mean, with this the is only public... ever going to cover a portion of anybody's 
food, you know, consumption. Mm. And there's all sorts of, you know, flexibility around it. We keep it so simple. It's fruits and vegetables, you know. And again, because it's only part, we're not trying to provide an entire healthy diet to somebody. We're just like, or we may be in the pocket of big broccoli, of course. But, um, you know, sure. those stakeholders that push sugar or, did, you know, and, and in favor of fat and all that stuff, I don't think it really comes into play. I think we're pretty clear. 50% of your plate, fruit and vegetables, simple, healthy eating message. And we're going to help you get that 50% on the plate. And there's a lot of room for that. So, I mean, that's my view. We don't need to get bogged down in dairy, cheese, all the questions of nuts and, you know, whole grains. Maybe it would be nice, but to get the full range, but we're not going to be paying for a full range anyway. I don't think that's realistic. We're going to be paying somebody like 80 bucks a month or something that can fully be consumed by fruits and vegetables and freeing up money for chips and for whole grains and dairy and all the other things you need. Kate? Yeah, I mean, I think just to, to build on both those points, uh, the history of nutrition in public health also has been laden with colonialism and white supremacy. Early editions of Canada's Food Guide came out due to experimentation on children in, in, in residential schools. Um, you know, and that there, there's a white supremacy encoded in current nutrition messaging. So we do need to think broadly about what constitutes a healthy diet that's culturally appropriate for people from different backgrounds um, and with different bodies and with different needs. Um, so I think that those are some of the components that need to be considered. And, and yeah, we all deserve a treat sometimes because the cognitive tax and the mental health stressors, the insecurity part of food insecurity, um, they matter too. Yeah, definitely fully agree with Kate. And I think the People should have the freedom for those choices of whether they want to have chips or not. But when the messaging out there has been that only fat, mm -hmm. we see this of when you go to different labeling, it's only gluten free and other areas, again, of not ensuring that we are being as transparent with that and that people can make the choices from poverty to addressing the colonial histories. And I think I know that public health always comes off as a buzzkill, but I do think the reality is, you know, not everyone has to be running two marathons a day. Uh, I think the idea that people can have chips or their, you know, pleasures or, you know, not have to go to the park and do aerobics is totally fine. I think the reality is... I really appreciate that validation. But I do think, to, to Josh's point, though, there's far too many people who don't have those privileges. And we see yeah. where parks are placed in the city of Toronto. We see where they're placed in different uh, parts of the country. And it's not an equal access issue uh, for people to make those choices. So I think this is about freedom. And currently... There are too many people denied the choices mm -hmm. to have any of those uh, privileges. All right. Thanks. Braden, are we done? We are. Thank you. Have we got a microphone? Yes, we do. Well, I want to really thank you uh, so deeply for these insights and everything you've added today. I also want to thank David because for as long as I've been involved in politics or policy for two decades, David's been someone who's been shaping it a lot. So if you can give a big round of applause to our panel and to the moderation with David. A huge thanks to each of you. And I really want to thank the, the panel for making your passion evident for making a huge dent in food security. As David alluded to, Ottawa can often be a place where numbers come across cold. And I think you've brought a lot of uh, warmth and feeling to why this matters and makes a difference in six million lives across this country. Uh, and hopefully this is a, a start of that discussion about how that uh, begins to narrow very quickly on that number. I do want to thank Adam, who just had to leave 10 minutes ago for being here, our parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Health, and certainly also Sean for being here the whole time as chair of the House of Commons uh, Health Committee uh, and taking all this in. And I know many people are keen to hear some of your insights after as well. So thanks finally to the Maple Leaf Center for Food Security and the Arell Family Foundation for your guidance on this. This is a really important policy theme for us to be taking on at this moment as we do move past that period of the pandemic and look ahead to the kind of Canada that we can be building, the kind of future that doesn't leave kids, families, uh, food insecure or behind at all. So thanks to everyone for taking the time today. See you soon.